good afternoon, everyone, again. My name is Olivia Haynes, and I'm the director of the San Francisco Bernstein and Company Center for Leadership and Ethics at Columbia Business School. And on behalf of our center, I'm happy to welcome you to our book talk with Honest to Greatness author, Peter Kazadoy, serial entrepreneur and proud CBS alum, in conversation with Paul Ingram, the Kravis Professor of Business at Columbia Business School. Our conversation today will focus on Peter's newly high, new, excuse me, highly rated book, Honest to Greatness, How Today's Greatest Leaders Use Brutal Honesty to Achieve Massive Success. We will dive into the frameworks and tools posed in the book, which teaches aspiring leaders how to use honesty as a critical strategy to lead and build successful businesses in today's hyper-transparent world. And at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Professor Paul Ingram. Since 1998, he has been on the faculty at the B School as one of our leading experts on values-based leadership, organizational culture, and ethical decision-making, teaching MBA, EMBA, PhD, and executive education students alike from across the globe his award-winning values hierarchy exercise, which Peter talks about extensively in the book and which we'll dive into today. Professor Ingram's research has also been cited in numerous publications and he has received the highest teaching distinction and awards, including the Commitment to Excellence Award as voted on by the graduating EMBA students. So before handing it over to Professor Ingram for this exciting conversation, we are really encouraging active dialogue today from our audience members. So please feel free to send questions through the Q&A box, which will be monitored throughout the event. And if your question is asked live during the event, you may be eligible to receive a free complimentary copy of Peter's book from the center. So with that, I will go ahead and I'll pass it on to Professor Ingram. And thanks, Peter, for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you, Olivia. Um, I have to say that I am happy to get the chance to talk with Peter because of the content of the book, I think the idea of honesty is both so elusive, but so critical. So a deep dive into honesty just sounds fabulous. But the real treat here is that Peter is an alum of the school. And I remember Peter as a student in my class in the first semester of uh, his degree in 2017. So Peter, it is so great to see you again. And congratulations on this great book. Uh, let's begin the conversation by talking about you. Uh, you just moved to Puerto Rico. Why? I did. Uh, Puerto Rico is a wonderful economic incentive program uh, to move entrepreneurs here that is wildly tax advantageous. And it turns out that even though I grew up in Boston and grew up as a very serious competitive figure skater, I absolutely hate the cold. So the two things uh, came together. The palm trees called and I answered the call. So here I, I just moved here last week, so uh, good to be here, and I definitely need to brush up on my Espanol. Oh, exciting. Um, so you talk about your, your deep history a little bit from Boston and figure skating. Is there a fact about you in the formative years or an experience that would be most telling for us understanding who you are today? Oh, gosh, what a great question. I would say, I mean, I have to go back to the figure skating, right? Because as I've learned, uh, as I got older, it turns out not every guy grows up figure skating, right? It's pretty out of the norm. And there were so many life lessons and not just the obvious ones about sort of getting knocked down and, and getting up again, but uh, particularly the ones around people and relationships, um, how to take coaching really, really well, and what it means to have a coach and mentor, um, how to diversify your opportunities to win in sports, but also hedge against, you know, am I going to be a professional figure skater forever? Probably not. How do I balance education and all these other things? Really, you know, I have to say, looking back, it taught me so many things about how to function in the world that I have carried with me, you know, forever and a day. And, uh, you know, also this thing about a solo sport, you know, it was very interesting because sometimes life is a solo sport, other times not. So I think that was also a big formative piece. How is leadership like figure skating? Oh, gosh, it feels really cold all the time and lonely. <laughs> That's how. That's how. And, right. and what I like to say is like after I've been out on the ice alone in the freezing cold, falling on my ass and like in front of 3000 people, nothing else is hard. Nothing else is difficult after that. That really helped me stand up in a boardroom full of people and not be afraid. Why? No one's coming to tackle me. 
right? So made it a little easier. So you referred to coaches. Uh, what do you see as the ingredient of a great coach? Uh, that they don't, they don't have the answers and they don't instill the answers. They have the questions and they encourage the questions. And that's what I found so often, Paul, in my career to date. You know, I started my first company at 22, right out of college, is that every time, not sometimes, every time someone or a group of people in an organization, big and small, have the answers. It's the right questions, the honest questions that aren't being asked. That's what was most shocking. And, and I think what makes a, a good coach great. Mm -hmm. Great answer. Um, what about a mentor in your business and leadership career? Oh, I got to have so many. I, I you know, because of the, the, so I started a marketing agency, right? And what happened by being an agency and being in marketing is every one of my clients got to turn into a mentor in some way, right? They were teaching me what to do. And sadly, more often than not, they were teaching me what not to do. And, and I'd say that was by, by far and away, it was what not to do. And, and that, you know, we'll get into the content of the book, but, you know, as far as what inspired me to kind of get on a soapbox and talk about this stuff is that the what not to do, how badly leaders behave, how much they lean on their own biases and ego and self-limiting beliefs and psychology and all that, that was all shocking and took me actually probably a decade to get over. So mm. all of them got to be my mentor, you know, in some way, shape or form. Mm. Mm. So in the book, you talk about values. What are your core values? Yeah, I'm going to jump to the top one, which is not honesty, actually. Uh, it's enlightenment. This idea that there's always a higher level of thinking, knowing, being, considering, that uh, has been transformative in my career as an entrepreneur, right? Starting out uh, as the typical 22-year-old, I thought I, well, first of all, I thought I knew everything at 12, right? Then at 15, then at 18, and that kept going, right? I think it took until like my upper 20s to realize that I really knew absolutely nothing um, and that that was kind of one of the keys. And I think something that shows up really consistently, whether it's Ray Dalio at Bridgewater or Warren Buffett or, or whomever. Um, so that, you know, that kind of realization and getting to that point of enlightenment and going always beyond has been mm -hmm. one of my greatest values and something now I try to instill through my companies, being obsessed with what we don't know and constantly filling in that blank. And that's what I yeah. found wrong with so many of the, the companies that I've, I've worked for either in a marketing capacity or business coaching capacity is they are so sure about what they're doing, whom they're doing it with, uh, their strategy, their direction. And then when, when one really looks at it from the outside, it's like, you not only don't have a strategy, you, it's clear you don't even know what strategy means. <laughs> and here's an entire organization and hundreds of millions of dollars pushing towards a direction, right? That's where honesty comes into play. Mm. Yeah, I love that you put it beautifully with enlightenment. Um, and it reminds me, it's not one of the most common top values, but I do find that a lot of really great leaders um, have some version of learner or growth or something very high in their, um, in their values hierarchy. So it's a real driver. Um, what does it mean for you as an entrepreneur in the marketing space? How does the pursuit of enlightenment enter into the way you run your company? You know, for us, we have always battled against what needs to happen, what we should do, and what the client wants to do. And when it comes to communications, right, so much of what we do sort of borders on communications and business strategy, because uh, so often they have this, strat this strategy, I'm using air quotes, right, and they'll tell us to do something, and we'll, we'll, we'll do the data, we'll do the research, Go to the customers, go to the frontline employees. By the way, the frontline employees always know the truth with a capital T, okay? More so than the executives. And we can get into stories about that. And we'd unearth all these insights and take it back and say like, hey, we can do what you're asking, but here's why we shouldn't. And so in the beginning, uh, you know, I'm 23, 24, I'm pitching these, these big companies. And I'm like, well, this is fantastic, right? I have all this data proving what these, these people should do. They're gonna love me. Paul, do you think they loved me when I walked into their boardroom? They had already decided on a strategy and then I was able to show them definitive concrete data showing them that they were wrong. What do you, how do you think they took that? I think they were probably pretty hostile to that. Yeah, they didn't like that very much. And so here I was thinking like, well, what's up with that? I was thinking business, right? Columns, rows, 
revenues, profits, like this is, this is basic stuff, right? Get to what's going on, get to what the customers want, do that, very simple. Turns out it's not that simple. Yeah, I had to get honest about that. Um, and once I did, I, I began to understand that I needed to be not a marketer, not a business person, but actually a psychologist, a mm. therapist to many of these executive mm. groups to get them not only to uh, move off their positions, um, but also help them understand what the positions are of their fellow executives and to regain consensus. These are all things I was wildly unprepared for, wildly unprepared for. Mm. Mm. And that I had to sort of adapt and grow. Now enter Columbia, right? So, you know, I had built a seven figure business, decided I was stupid and needed to go back to school, get an MBA. Thank goodness I did because I was right. right? I was, it was amazing how much I didn't know about the basics of accounting and finance and, and leadership, you know, and here I was kind of bootstrapping myself to, to some degree of success. Um, but what Columbia did was give me a language and a framework to stick all the things I sort of intuitively knew in the back of my mind into the dialogue, the vocabulary, a, a utilitarian kind of method to, to bring this stuff into a group with structure. And that was just incredibly mm. valuable. Mm. So that sounds like a real challenge to be a successful entrepreneur and then start business school where in a sense you have to have a kind of stance that if you're gonna benefit from it, humility and kind of openness. So how did you resist what, what must have been a kind of temptation to present yourself as a business success and, um, and approach the program that way as opposed to as a learner? At times I did that well, and at times I did that really not well. One of the things that helped me, and humility is the word, is just meeting everyone else there and realizing that like, no matter who I think I am in my head, and I, folks at home can't see this. I'm all of like five foot seven inches tall, right? I'm a little, I'm, here I am, I think I'm a giant, right? Uh, walking among giants in the, the hallways of you know, Manhattan was super helpful for that. Um, mm. and, and actually a lesson I carried with me right out the doors of Columbia, like in the first week, I was like, that, thank goodness uh, all these people are awesome because yeah, that's a reminder that I probably need to shut the hell up and do a lot more listening, a lot less talking, a lot less peacocking, all the things that we entrepreneurs love to do. Uh, I'm just one of the few willing to be honest about that. I, I think that's a great explanation, but here's the, here's the sticking point for me. And the reason I'm asking is because, you know, I know we've got MBAs as well as alums on the call today and you know, I, it would be great if we could give them an insight in optimizing their experience. So you enter the program and there's incredibly successful people who are part of it. One temptation, and you know, I've seen it and I know you must have seen it from time to time, is that people will say, oh, I'm with such incredible people, I will present myself as being all knowing myself, right? Mm -hmm. So one response to the uh, impressive human capital of your class would be to listen, absorb, and view that as an opportunity, but it could also trigger defensiveness. And in fact, we talked about the defensiveness of the executive teams. So why, I mean, what would you tell a student? What would you tell an executive to help invite them into this position of seeking enlightenment as opposed to telling the world what they know? That's such a good question because it's something like, if I could go back and tell my you know, 23 year old something, I could tell them all the lessons I've learned, Paul. Would I have listened? Probably not. I had to learn that one for myself, you know, stop talking. I literally wrote an article uh, that literally says like, you do a lot better if you just shut the F up and, and people do. Um, and I remind people that I coach that all the time. I had to learn that. Uh, I like to talk, I have an acting background. Uh, I consider myself, you know, to be a loquacious individual and I have to remind myself to shut up and ask questions. And I've actually, I actually kind of have a Rolodex of questions that I now ask people to clog mm. my, this part of my face. Mm. So I, I'm not doing things that, that you know, are, are, are not them out of what I'm trying to achieve. That's mm. tough. And one of the things I observe in groups, to your point, executive teams, is the one who talks the most usually knows the least usually knows the least. Um, and yeah. I, I like to tell the story of the dinner table, right? If you go to, to a dinner table 
and you're sitting around with a group of people you haven't met, and there's one individual in the corner who hasn't said much all night, right? And everyone else is talking, having conversations. I'll ask the question, I'll ask it to the group. You tell me, of all the people at that dinner table, who do you think has absorbed the most, learned the most, kind of has the best perception of each person? And, and every time, Paul, they answer the same way. Well, the person who hasn't said anything. And I say, exactly. <laughs> mm. Now you don't need the lesson, right? That's it. Mm. So let's talk about the book. What inspired you to write it? Um, well, I didn't, you know, one of the things about being in this business about honesty is I get to be honest, right? So I never set out to write about, think about, or frankly, even care about honesty. It's the truth. I set out to write a marketing book because I was so frustrated by how simple communications can be and how much these otherwise well-meaning executives would mess it up with all the things we talked about. Ego, self-limiting beliefs, uh, inability to assess themselves, right? And so on and so forth. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I take it, I know nothing about how to publish a book. I queried 400 literary agents. Many of them got back to me and said, please don't ever email me again. Some got back to me and said, this will never be a book, you suck. Uh, and then luckily three took a meeting and one signed me. And as soon as he did, he was like, you know, Peter, uh, this isn't really a book about marketing. It's a book about honesty. And I mm. said to myself, well, great. I hired the one literary agent who obviously didn't read the book because there's nothing to do with honesty. Uh, and then of course I looked at it more closely and I said, gosh, you know what? This, they are absolutely right. This is much bigger than um, should we be honest in the way we communicate? It's really about what do we believe as a society, you know, in the, in, here in the 21st century, when everyone can go and look me up on Google while they're listening to me to see if I'm full of crap or not, what does that mean? You know, what, what does it mean for the way we interact with each other, the way we uh, look at trends that are evolving in the marketplace and ultimately evolve ourselves as leaders? And so the book really took a turn in that way. And, and this is probably the point where I need to stop and, and say, again, with honesty, I know this is you know, the Burst Bernstein Center for Ethics, but I'm not here to talk about ethics. I think people should be ethical. I think they should be moral. I think that's wonderful. We should be good people. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about strategic, brutal honesty and its importance as a tool, as a weapon to achieve outcomes, to achieve profitability, business success. I'm a capitalist like any other. You know, I have just found that the missing puzzle piece and the one, by the way, that the organizations in my book use to create massively successful outcomes and profitability just happens to be honesty. And I'm, I'm sort of entertained with how simple it is and yet how many groups out there miss, miss, the, miss that four-year-old lesson of honesty is the best policy entirely. So what is brutal honesty? Yeah, I wanna make that point, right? Uh, it's strategic, brutal honesty, strategic, brutal honesty for a reason. So listen, you know, when I was first coming out with the book, people are like, oh, Peter, this is great. Uh, I love that you wrote a book about honesty. I'm so honest. I, whatever I think and feel, I just share it all the time. And I say, oh, that's interesting. Um, I don't think that's honesty. I think that's just being a jerk. You know, anyone with kids knows that it's probably not a good idea to just blurt out everything that comes to mind and tell them the truth. Like, that's probably not going to work, probably going to piss people off. Uh, I've dabbled in that form of honesty as a teenager. I, I should have been voted most likely to continue being a jerk in high school. Like that was me. I learned that that doesn't work. So, so then what is it? That's not what it is. What is it? Um, in the book, I break down three main ways in which organizations adopt strategic brutal honesty for outcomes. And, and by the way, the organizations that do the best, they align these three. The first I talk about, Paul, is honest about the community. You know, in other words, what's going on in society, what's going on in the industry? What are the trends happening? I tell uh, a wonderful opening story about Blockbuster and how they had years. I mean, everyone knows Netflix came, put them out of business. What they don't realize is Blockbuster had years and meetings and time to think about this and adapt and grow and change. And they just wanted to put their heads in the sand about what was going on. And, and as the sort of detail to that story that I find most interesting, Towards the end, they actually did realize Netflix had the right model and began to turn that ship towards streaming. And Carl Icahn comes in, right? We all know who that is, right? Venerable investor, successful. He comes in as an activist investor in Blockbuster. And he said, you know what? I think people love going out at eight o'clock at night in their pajamas, sifting through Blockbuster. Oh, they don't have the video. They find something else. They return it too late. They pay late fees. They love that. 
Americans love that. It's just Americana, right? Of course, we know he wasn't exactly correct about that, but but like it just goes to show, like they had all that opportunity to be honest about what was going on in the world, the shifting trends and behaviors of their own customers. It was pretty obvious, uh, if if only they're willing to get out of their own way. Now, the second level is getting honest with and about the others around you. Now, that's an important distinction. Sometimes you just have to come out and say, "Sorry, I messed up. Here's what happened. Here's what we're going to do to fix it." Wonderful case study on Domino's Pizza that I talk about in the book. About 10, 12 years ago, I don't know if you remember, J. Patrick Doyle, CEO of Domino's, goes on national TV, says, listen, folks, turns out that our pizza sucks. It's just not very good. And I'm sorry, you deserve better than that. So we're going to fix it. And they took cameras into their kitchens. They took cameras out to customers, said, here, try this pizza. What do you think? They published all those videos online. And if you had said to yourself, gee, that's interesting, a CEO is on TV bashing his own product. I'm going to invest in that company. And you had invested, you would have, you would have had a 3,000% return over the next 10 years, way more than the S&P 500, which was roaring through that time, just by being honest. Now, that's honest with people. Sometimes we need to be honest about people, right? About their own, this is back to the, do you have kids, right? You know this. Your kid, where are your kids at? If you have their best interest at heart, truly, which is not always the case in business, but should be, then you need to understand where they're at honest about their ego, their self-limiting beliefs, their ability to understand. This is why we don't always want to just get honest with people. Sometimes we need to be honest about them and knowing the difference and having techniques to be about them to make sure that's not just an excuse to swindle people is really important. I, I do a lot of that in the book and in the workshops I give. And the final level, Paul, is getting honest with and about the self, with our own biases and self-limiting beliefs as leaders. Now, I often get asked, you know, why not start there? And the reason is simple. If I have to get honest with myself as a uh, first century Roman gladiator, that's very different contextual, right? That's a different time, different place, different culture, different values than we live in now. It's important to understand context and, and then go from there. And what I've found is that companies that are willing to be honest on all three levels, what they actually end up doing, the action part of this, is they transform. They transform like Domino's did, and they transform like Quicken Loans did when it invented Rocket Mortgage. They actually change the people around them because they've gotten honest about who they are, their own values, and how much alignment needs to be created. And as you very well know, once you change the people, you can influence the world, influence society, build things that are truly incredible, truly industry dominating and profit making. And that is simply how strategic brutal honesty works. So let's dig into the adjectives a little bit. Why brutal honesty? Yeah, because it is brutal. You know, when we are kids and we eat the cookie and then our parents ask, did you eat the cookie? We're like, yeah, yeah, it was really good. And what do they do? They punish us. I told you not to eat the cookie, you shouldn't do that. Now, the next time they ask, did you eat, because we're going to eat the cookie anyway, right? I love cookies, I don't know about you. Then they ask, did you eat that cookie? We're like, no, I don't know. I don't know who ate it. I don't know. Was it me? I don't think so. I don't know who ate the cookie, right? It's just sort of ingrained in, in ourselves. Self-protection through dishonesty, right? And that's okay. Listen, people should protect themselves. The problem is that mechanism as we grow up and become adults can prevent us from giving constructive feedback, from taking constructive feedback, from looking at the world and realizing how narrow our vision is and taking steps to expand that vision, like deciding one is stupid and going back to business school. Not that I know anyone who's done that. So, you know, we, we, I, my mission is to unstick people, right? To make them realize that the brutal part is for them, for their own psychology, to give them permission to be uncomfortable. Oh, it's I, like, because here's why, Paul, right? Everyone thinks they're honest. I do executive workshops. I'm like, is anybody dishonest here? What do you, you think anybody raises their hand? Of course not. Everyone thinks they're honest. But then I say, are you brutally honest? They're like, well, brutal, man. I don't want to be brutal, right? Okay, well, we're going to be brutal today now. And if it works today and now, which it always does, we're going to be brutal for the rest of your life because now you have permission to be uncomfortable. And comfort is the enemy of greatness. I will tell you that about any business. I don't care what industry it's in. I don't care what size it is. Comfort is the enemy of greatness and success. So where's the line on that? So permission to be brutal, but how, how does that stop license to be obnoxious? Yeah. Because that doesn't work either, right? 
And this is exactly what comes up in workshops and somebody, right? They're like, well, I'm going to get Peter on this one, right? You know, I, we're not supposed to you know, do that. Negative feedback doesn't work. I'm like, yeah, why doesn't negative feedback work? That's interesting, right? Because negative feedback is, is certainly the most direct route, most honest route. What's up with that? And they say, well, I don't want to hurt people's feelings. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. So negative feedback works. It just doesn't work on humans because we have big giant egos. And in business, we're not managing people. We're managing egos. One of the most basic frameworks we can have in place is to simply ask permission. And what's interesting about that is if I say, can I be honest with you? Most mm -hmm. of your reactions is, why would you ask that? Were you not honest with me before? Okay. Hmm. And so on the surface, that seems kind of stupid, but, but here's the difference, right? Paul, I see this report you gave me. Thank you so much. I can see you put a lot of work into it. I have feedback about it. I would love to just blurt it out, but I'm worried I'm going to hurt your feelings. And I don't want to do that. I, I just want to make this report awesome, just like you do. Do you mind if I share some of that stuff with you? And, and Paul, what do you think the person says, right? Of course. Of course you can share it with me. I can take, I can take that, right? Whereas before, could they have taken it? Of course not. They would have cowered in a corner, right? So in a way, we need to be better as leaders, being honest about people, about how they work, of reducing those ego barriers bringing them down so that we can be honest and, and operate on an honest playing field rather than assault people. It's the surprise. It's not the honesty. It's the surprise that gets people. They thought they had done a good job. They thought they were doing well. They, and then now all of a sudden they're not. That's by the way in a marriage, why cheating is so devastating. It's not the act, it's the surprise. How stupid am I? How didn't I know, right? And that, that's why, you know, I find business so fascinating. And, and my comments earlier about psychology, if we can understand people and how they work, we can do wildly fantastic things in business. That's what took me so long to understand. What about strategic honesty? Because it would sound like if you're being strategic, that it almost sounds like sometimes honest, sometimes not honest. So how does strategy enter into it? Yeah, I mean, I've seen managers, right? Let me tell you a story. So I, I worked in a, it was a startup, came in as a consultant, so I usually do. And the owner says to me, my people are stupid. And I said, okay, well, let's, you know, let's test that theory where they can't all be stupid. He's like, yeah, no, they, they never have good ideas. They suck. I want to fire them all. I said, well, let me, let me sit in on a meeting, right? For some reason, Paul, every, anytime I say that, people get un uncomfortable, right? They give me a look like, oh, he's like, all right, fine. So I'm sitting in on this meeting and all of his people are brainstorming around a business problem. One owner, right, guy owns the company, my client. Everything they say, he's sitting in the corner like twisting his face and like uh, making like noises and like, oh, that, oh, I can't do that. But, but, you know, trying his best to stay quiet. And by the way, their ideas were perfectly reasonable. And I said to him at the end, uh, you know, pulled him aside, they all left, he said, you know, I observed the meeting. I was, I was hearing what everyone was saying. And I, I think I have a solution for you. And he's like, oh, well, thank goodness. I mean, what, you think I should fire everyone? I said, no, I think you should shut the hell up. Yeah, I think you should just be quiet and let them make you money. Uh, and the reason I, I tell that story is because he thought he was being honest. Is that strategically honest? No, of course not. If he had just sat back and asked himself, like, did I hire the right people? Was I confident at that time? Do they abide by my, my core values? Yes, yes, yes. Are they trying to make me money? Yes. Then it's not about your version of honesty. It's about what's going on here. And, and mm -hmm. that's just one microcosm mm -hmm. of why we need to be strategic about the way we deploy honesty and that we can't use it as an excuse, as a crutch to stay within our own frameworks. The whole idea is out of the comfort zone, right? out of the comfort zone. If, if somebody comes to my workshop and I have not had this happen yet, right? I have people enter this way. Oh, I'm an honest person. Everything that's gonna be said here is gonna confirmation bias, right? And by the end, I, you know, my job, if I do it well, is to get people to realize that they're full of crap. It's the first thing I say in my keynote. Nobody ever invites me back because I'm gonna tell you all you're full of crap. I use a better word than that, but you know what I mean? Because I want people to get pushed, right? It's the same thing as the honesty quiz we were talking offline earlier. Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about that at the end, but I want people to get uncomfortable with this stuff. Otherwise, you're just sitting in your own pile of crap, your mindset, and getting nose blind to it. And that's the worst thing we leaders can do. Does brutal honesty work the same for everyone? Does it work the same for men and women? Does it work the same across generations? Or are there different versions of 
strategically brutally honest. No, I don't, I don't think so. I love that you mentioned gender because that comes up a lot in conversations, in workshops. It, whenever it's a mixed group or an all women's group, I will inevitably get the comment, I can't be brutally honest because then I get called a this, that, or the other. People don't like it. They, they make assumptions about me, which by the way, as a society is terrible, right? We can have a whole workshop just on that. But the important point is that for, for someone who thinks they're going to encounter those kinds of obstacles, getting permission, like I talked about earlier, and bringing in an own, uh, one's own self-dialogue of self-awareness is huge. It's the difference between just, I'm gonna be me and I'm gonna give Paul criticism and I'm just gonna walk away from the conversation and I've been true to myself, okay, cool, but that's not strategic. So instead I'm gonna say, you know, I have this feedback for you and if I give it to you, you're going to think I'm a total, you know, a-hole or whatever. And uh, that's the last thing I want. So, you know, what, tell me, you know, if I should just walk away or whatever, or should I should give it to you. That, that's so important, building that into your repertoire. I mean, it's one of many communication structures that people can yeah. use to be strategically brutally honest and not run into those kinds of, you know, terrible as they may be, those assumptions. We do judge books by covers here uh, in, you know, the world. So, you know, we need to be honest about that. Hmm. So you did mention the styles of honesty. Uh, so uh, for the audience, uh, if you go to Peter's uh, Brutally Honest website, you will have this opportunity to take uh, a survey and learn your honesty style. So Peter, what are the styles? Yeah. So there are four of them and I, I made them and I can never remember them, but one's an honest uh, challenger, honest follower. Um, there are two others. Like I said, I, I teach this stuff and I can never remember all four, but go and take it. The honesty type that you get is actually not that important. But what's important is that you realize that the quiz is testing you on what you believe, on your habits, on your characteristics. It's not testing you on, you know, it's not MBTI. It is not scientific. It's designed to ask you things like, what, you know, when you get information, what do you do with it? Do you believe everything that everyone says? Do you question assumptions? How deeply do you dive into a research report when the news says, you know, study shows 8% of blah, blah, blah does this. Like, are you like, oh, that's crazy. I'm gonna tell everyone on Facebook about that. Or are you like, yeah, okay, well maybe, let me see what study that is, it seems interesting. So it's testing that sort of thing. How do you act? You know, what, what are your actions and beliefs? And most folks, will end up in you know, the second or third categories, not, not as, a, as an honest leader. Um, and that's okay, because you can actually shift your beliefs and actions. That's the hope. But after you take that quiz, you go to a video and I walk you through each of them and what they mean and so on and so forth. Mm, mm, that sounds great. So um, if this is behavioral, but habitual, what's at the root of stopping people from being brutally honest. Uh, so uh, the, the barrier inside people, because it all sounds so great, but as you say, almost nobody is doing it. So what stops them? Assumption and self-interest. Assumption and self-interest. They assume that either everyone else is wrong or they are wrong. And that the truth is sort of already present, right? This is like efficient market theory, right? All the information's already baked in, so I don't have to do anything. That's what it is. Uh, and, or, and or self-interest. Yeah, I could be honest here, but will I lose my job? Will I lose my spouse? Will I lose my kids? Will I, you know, what will I lose? Uh, and, and as anyone who's passed through CBS knows, the pain of loss is greater than the joy of gain. Um, and that's strong. The idea here is this. If you are at, and you know, this is a, a point that many of the CEOs in my book made, if you're at a company and you love the company and you align with their core values, then figure out a way to be to use strategic brutal honesty. Bring in an outside person to teach. Br assemble a coalition. By the way, don't march into the CEO's office and tell them they suck and we should be more honest. That's probably not going to work. Build a coalition of, of people around you who are interested in getting at the truth, um, who are interested in getting the insights of customers passed up. And this, Paul, happens... All the time I go into an organization, the, the executive team is like, we need to solve this problem. I want you to work with the frontline employees who are responsible for that and figure it out. And I walk into the room with the frontline people. And what do you think they say? Well, thank goodness you're here. 
we've been trying to present this solution for years. We already know exactly what to do. We already know what the price is. We are, and so I'm like, well, this is great. Well, the first time this happens is a big regional water company. I'm like, this is fantastic. I go back to the, the leadership and I'm like, here you go. I'm like, this is the easiest, you know, money I ever made. And they're like, oh yeah, well, you know, we can't do that. And here's why. The, the, none of those reasons they listed had anything to do with logic, right? They could afford it. It was absolutely the right thing. I verified they, that the frontline people had done their work. It was just simply either lazy. Well, that would mean I have to work more hours. So that would mean I have to, you know, whatever. And it was completely self-interest based and sad. And if you're an employee who comes into an organization and it's clear that leadership is unwilling to be open-minded to these sorts of things, honest to goodness, the folk, you know, from uh, the CEO of Quicken Loans to, you know, Ray, everyone was like, leave. Literally, that was their advice. They were like, get out of there, go somewhere your talents are gonna appreciate it. I mean, uh, Jay Farner at Quicken Loans was like, come work for us. We'll take you. They want people to come and challenge and do better. I mean, they split off companies all the time with employees who come to them with great ideas. That's how Rocket Mortgage was born. Someone, I think they said it was like an intern, was like, how come we have to kill a tree every time we get a mortgage? That doesn't make any sense. Why can't we just do it on our phone? And they sat around and they were like, gee, why can't you? That's interesting. I mean, we're in the mortgage business. We all have phones. And then literally they said, go do it. They're like, go do that. Let us know how it goes. If you need resources, let us know. Very simple. By the way, that's how I run my company. It's how I've always run it, but didn't know. Very strict about the who and the what, who we are and what we do. The how, I could give a crap less. I'm not babysitting. Mm. Right? People that work with mm. me and for me, like, I don't care how you do it. Just do it. Don't, don't break any laws, you know? Uh, and if you need help, let me know. Simple. And people love, turns out, people love owning their own jobs and outcomes when you just let them work. Sadly, as I've found, that's not the case throughout corporate America. Yeah, that's enlightening. That's a great way to put it. Um, so let's go to the audience. Uh, we got a question from Edgar, um, who is taken, as I was, by your technique of asking questions of others to keep yourself quiet. Um, so could you share some of the questions that are on your, on your list? Oh, I'm happy to. Yeah. And usually, you know, I'll start out getting context, right? Like, you know, where do you work now? And then I'll ask things like, what do you hate most about that, about that company or about your work? I love getting people to open up and complain because they get passionate about complaining. People are passionate about complaining, right? But again, let's get honest about, about people, right? And once they start complaining, I ask them, how would you fix that? You know, how would you do it better? empower people, right? That's a great structure because I'm gen genuinely interested. I'm learning, right? How would this person fix this problem? And that's what business school is, right? Learning how people have fixed problems so that I don't have to struggle when I see that problem. But also it's an, it's an empowering question. I had to learn, I told you, most voted most likely to continue being a jerk in high school, right? I had to learn how to empower people, how to help them be empowered to influence them, not in a negative way, connotative way, but in a positive way to help, you know, as a coach, right? It's my job to influence. So how would you fix that? People love being put on a pedestal. And I'll say, that's really interesting. Have you pitched that up? What barriers are in your way to that? So I, in a way, you know, it's kind of a coaching model. And I was adopting that coaching model before I was actually formally coaching businesses, which really helped me. That was not strategic. That was just guesswork on my part, right? I don't want to claim credit where credit is not due. Um, but asking those questions to get people to think, they'll pause and they'll say that, you know, I get all the time. Nobody, no one ever asks me that. Why? Because here's how a typical conversation works. What do you do for work? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, well, I do this, that, and the other. And I, blah, 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 and I, and I, and I, and then the person never shuts up, right? So the more questions you can ask that are open-ended, never ask yes, no questions, the better. Hmm. Uh Ravi is asking a question I know a lot of people must have on their mind, um, which is what's the role of hierarchy? You know, uh, many of us are not at the top of our organization. Uh, and so what do you advise for somebody leading up, um, trying to instill some strategic brutal honesty into their organization if the people above them are not completely representing that? Yeah, I have a whole chapter in my book dedicated to this because I think that's the real opportunity. It's, it's relatively simple for a C-suite executive, well, for the CEO to decide to implement this top down. And usually when that happens, it is such a breath of fresh air. 
such a breath of fresh air. It's actually more difficult than you would think for a COO, CFO, CRO to, to come and influence everyone else. Depends on their power position. That can be as complicated sometimes as someone on a frontline team or whatever. So, so I'll tell you what I talk about in, in the book. And this came you know, partly from me and my experience, but also from all the CEOs, you know, Ritz-Carlton, Quicken Loans, Bridgewater, you know, Bethany Frank, all the leaders I talk about in my book, right? Number one is know what not to do, which is march into the office and say, you know, this place sucks and you suck and we, we should do a better job and we should be more honest. It doesn't work, probably gonna get you fired. What you can do is uh, recognize what's in the mind and the mindset of whatever small group leader you're working with. What are their incentives? What are they trying to accomplish? What is their personal goal? And try to swim with the current. If you know that they are trying to achieve X, Y, and Z, that's step one. How does strategic brutal honesty help that? It always helps that, whatever that is. But you got to figure out what that is. Number two, assemble a coalition. Do not go alone. It's easy to ignore one person who's on an honesty crusade. Very easy to say like, all right, they've been smoking the ganja. Let's not you know, pay attention to them. But harder to uh, when five, three, four, five people walk into an office together and they're like, oh, we're so excited. We have all these uh, interesting things we could do. And I'm sure as soon as I'm saying that, right, empathy, you're probably thinking, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to work more. We're gonna do it all with that. You know, we can just get your blessing on this. Again, empathy, what are they trying to do? They're trying to go home at five o'clock and have dinner with their family, not you know, stay after hours. Uh, and then finally, bring data. This is not the time for opinions. You need to bring facts with you. You know, we took a look and, and, and quick, quick aside to illustrate this, um, this is exactly what uh, Domino's Pizza did. The, the CMO of them was Russell Wiener and he said to himself, I see the data that our customers don't like our pizza. And he had a decision to make. He could just bring that data in with he, he himself, but he didn't do that. He went and queried all the executives and the managers and said, what do you think about our pizza? Very clever. Because then what he was able to show is, here's what customers think. Here's what the executives think. By the way, the executives were barely ate Domino's pizza, right? Compared to the 21 year old who orders it four, four days a week. They were like, yeah, pizza's fine, I think, right? <laughs> right? Um, and he was able to show like, here's the discrepancy in the data. What do you wanna do about this? And all the managers had already seen it. So they're standing behind Russell saying like, yeah, we agree, we gotta do something. Very hard to ignore. Data, groups, that's the way we wanna start to approach this. And I also, as, a, as you know, a, a, one last point on that, be honest about who your manager is. Now, more and more, some enlightened, intelligent um, corporations are making tunnels of access elsewhere. So you don't always have to go up the ladder, right? There's the meeting of all this level department heads that happens at once a month on a Tuesday, right? Those can be really valuable opportunities to start to bring this into the conversation so that you're not just butting heads with your manager because your manager might suck, but the manager over here might actually be really open-minded. And instead of sitting there and thinking, oh gosh, I wish I had them. I guess I'm not gonna do anything with my day now. Go network, go use your, your team building skills and your, your brand new empathy skills. Start to build those relationships so you can work around without pissing people off and getting fired. Asterisk. Yeah. Well, that's really strategic. Building a consensus, finding the paths around uh, a difficult executive. So thanks for that practical answer. Um, so Peggy is talking about a phenomenon we're all familiar with about emphasis on teams and consensus that sometimes we'll see in organizations. Um, how do you reconcile that with brutal honesty? Is that the enemy? Is consensus the enemy of honesty? Sometimes. Yeah, and actually stretch and say oftentimes. Oftentimes groupthink is so powerful that it overwhelms the right answer. And, you know, I use that term loosely because there are more than one right answer almost always, right? But the, the right answer directionally. And one of the biggest ways I have found to avoid that is to make sure that every voice is heard. Never, never take polls with everyone looking around at who's voting for what. Just don't do it. There's no benefit to it. Always present facts, present facts, and then take, and I'll go one step further, right? Framework called facts and feelings, okay? When you're putting on the table some decision that needs to be made with a group. Okay, folks, let's get all the facts out. What do we know? People will, every time, insert their feelings about it, right? Or what they think. 
yeah, well, I saw this piece of data about how that logistics is operating in our warehouse. But I think, no, no, hold on. We're going to do that next. Then we go to feelings next. Let's just get the facts. That's the fact. Then log separately all the feelings. Because what happens when you separate them is it becomes very clear that the feelings have nothing to do with the facts. It has to do with Sally's personal experience, and it has to do with uh, Bob's uh, in compensation incentive, and it has to do with you know whatever. Uh, so separating those is important. And then once those are all listed, then go vote, not in public, but you know on a little piece of paper or in your portal, uh, your digital portal, or whatever, and tally those up. And if there's a group conversation, do things like set timers for people to talk. Invariably, one or two people is going to dominate the conversation. Just simply don't allow it to happen. We want everyone to talk here. Everyone gets 30 seconds or 60 seconds or whatever and cut them off. Put that into the culture. We believe that everyone has a voice. We believe that everyone here is intelligent enough to have a seat at the table and deserves to be listened to. And that's why everyone's gonna get 30 seconds. Because usually, Paul, the person, again, dinner party, right? Who's sitting in the corner that hasn't said anything. If I've found anything to be true, it's that usually they're the most objective one. And what they realize is that everyone's busy debating subjectivity and they're thinking to themselves, Sally's feelings have nothing to do with this. I'm not even gonna enter the conversation. Very interesting, right? So we gotta make sure that you know, the person sitting in the corner gets heard. Those are a few tactics you can use. So we have a question from uh, my colleague, Todd Jick, um, who is pointing to Bridgewater, I think is appropriately perhaps the most prominent example of a version of brutal honesty that they call radical candor. And um, Todd is sharing the observation that his experience is that MBAs either say that that is an objectionable model to them, they couldn't function there, or they love it. Um, is it a model for what you're talking about, or does it have some flaw um, that you think, um, think that, that organizations should be doing better than? Yeah, it absolutely has some flaws. One of them, and you can read this on any you know, message board about Bridgewater from, from employees, is exactly what I was describing earlier. Their, employee, their employees, no matter where you are, has the ability to directly challenge uh, their superior one-on-one. -on -one. What that does in the Bridgewater culture is it kicks off a massive, long, and drawn-out discovery about what's true that involves multiple departments and multiple people and wastes everyone's time. The reason why, and, and this might seem antithetical to what I've just been talking about, but remember the facts and feelings? If there's a feeling at play, it gets the same treatment, which means the system of radical truth and radical transparency can be abused. I can create a vendetta against someone at Bridgewater and launch an entire campaign about it to mess up their life and doesn't, you know, doesn't cost anything to me. That's a problem. You know, that's something they, they need to probably, probably look at. Um, so, but, but, you know, I also want to herald them for how pioneering they are. By the way, if I give them my $100 million, do I want them to sit around and, and not speak the truth when they're considering how to invest it? Of course not. You know, when there are literally billions of dollars on the line, what else are we going to do but be brutally honest, uh, strategically brutally honest about what's going on. So I think for them in particular with the sector they're in, it, it's probably okay they go, in my opinion, a little too far. But make no mistake, that can work everywhere. Why? Because again, this is about people and behavior and habit and psychology. It's not about sector or industry or any of that. So let me just dig into something. I think I've heard you say a couple of times, and maybe I didn't get it quite right. Um, but you talk about facts and feelings. You talked earlier about kind of the prominence of data. And I have to just say that from the perspective of, you know, someone like a lot in the audience who works with data and analyzes data, that I'm not sure that I would put as much privilege on data as I think I hear you saying, right? I mean, facts, whose facts? Facts depend on perspective. Facts without interpretation are really nothing. Um, you never have all the facts. So have I heard you right? Or is there something, you know, are the feelings set aside? You know, there's, there's lots of approaches to the successful human interaction that would say, 
you know, the police court facts are the small part of it, but what really matters is the feelings. Are you aligned with that or are you coming from a different perspective? Very perceptive. So first I wanna point out that Paul has used a fantastic and strategically brutally honest framework, which is, I heard you say, not you said, but I heard you say. I can't be upset with Paul over what he heard me say, but when you put words in someone's mouth, they don't like that, right? That's another great tactic and very nicely done. Um, secondly, to your point about data, what I loved most about my class at Columbia about data and data science is that the entire point of the class was that data can mislead people. And what a wonderful lesson because it does all the time. Look at this entire pandemic that's just occurred and how the CDC has been running around like chickens with their heads cut off, right? Because we don't know why. Maybe they had the data, maybe they didn't have the data, maybe they're misinterpreting the data, they're getting parsed on words, etc. So your comment is really well taken and very insightful. Here's the deal. Most of the companies I've seen, and I'm only going to speak for per from personal experience right now, but this would be a really interesting study. Most of the companies I've seen don't want to do the research, don't want to look at the data because it doesn't, because it conflicts with their worldview and their assumptions and, and what they what would best behoove them. It is that basic, right? That's what makes me so fired up about this topic at the end of the day, is I'm not talking about the fringe case that I, th I think you're, you're hinting at perhaps. I'm talking about the basics that I've seen, and by the way, startups of the Fortune 500, where they just don't wanna know. They don't wanna mm -hmm. know the truth. That is just so bad. But my, my facts and feelings framework works exactly for what you're describing as well, because picture a situation where as a group, you have culturally agreed in objectivity, you've culturally agreed to strategic brutal honesty and all the ways that we've talked about it so far. And you have a list that reads, we have these sort of studies here, but the words that are coming up on the feelings are distrust, incomplete, uh, then, okay, we at least we've done our due diligence, at least we've done our job to figure out what objective pieces we have. Then if we wanna sit around and debate how we feel about it and take a vote, not in public, so be it. But Paul, I'm telling you, I, of all the companies I've worked with, it's been hundreds. It's probably two that I've seen operate that way. Yeah, yeah, I can believe it. Uh, so here's an interesting question from George, and I'm going to read it because I want to make sure I get it right in George's George's voice. So George is from a country in South America where being dishonest is part of daily survival. Anyone who tries to act honest is labeled as a fool and naive. Um, of course, this has creeped into all of social political spheres, and it's caused the country to have a deep crisis. Any thoughts on how to approach this problem for, from the point of view of social, private sector, and political leadership? Yep, such a good one, because this is so cultural. Everything we're talking about is cultural, and I, I've gotten you know, executives from all around the world who say similar things. Um, countries entire nations that just simply don't operate this way and have the stigma attached to it. Here's the question, the question that can empower you and everyone you work with. What's the opportunity cost? We've, we can very easily quantify the cost of doing something. What we don't often think about is if we're going to make a decision as a company, as a leader and move forward, what is the opportunity cost if we are not being entirely honest about what's going on in society, in the industry around us, with the executives or other team members in this room, and finally with, with me. There's always an opportunity cost, and we rarely stop and ask ourselves what it is. So if, if in a meeting, a conversation happened like this, um, read this book by this really short ex-figure skater, it was kind of ugly, but it's an interesting topic about strategic brutal honesty. And it dawns on me that I'm kind of not being honest right now because I have, you know, I, I have my cultural hat on, I have self-preservation, I have this and that. If we all were sitting here with that same sort of lens, what might we be missing? What if we suspended that for a mm -hmm. moment and did this in a strategically, brutally honest way? We don't have to go that direction, but what if we just did it as a thought experiment? That's how you can begin to get at the opportunity cost here. And by the way, that that's, the combination of everything we've been talking about, you know, enlightening that blind spot, doing it in a way that doesn't offend people and egos, but really getting to what we're missing. This honesty is an act of 
omission. It's not about adding something. It's about taking away the BS and then mm -hmm. looking at what's left. Mm -hmm. So um, we have time for one last question in our final minutes um, from Mahesh. And I think this is on the topic of, of adding and taking away. So Mahesh is observing there's a balance between listening and contributing to a larger discussion. Um, how do you strike that balance? Uh, you have talked about shutting up and listening, but honesty involves understanding, but it also involves some assertion. So how do we walk the tightrope? One of the most incredible frameworks I've learned beyond the one, Paul, that you illuminated about, you know, I heard you say, is just simply repeating back what others say. Because mm -hmm. if you make a practice out of that, right? So let me get this straight. I just want to understand. I think I heard you say X, Y, Z. So often they'll stop and think about it and say, well, yeah, you know, I didn't, I guess I didn't mean it like that. What I really meant was, and we're not, so what's interesting is we're not even operating from the same, same place. Um, people, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, sometimes say what they don't mean and sometimes mean what they don't say. And so I, I you know, hear and I want people to participate with honesty. I want their words to be honest, right? And their intentions to be honest. But finding that common, that actual common foundation of truth is 98% of this. After that, what's really interesting, right? And it's like, let's, th this ties up beautifully because in the beginning we talked about coaching and what makes a great coach and having the right questions. People work themselves out. People will come to the right directionally correct answer if they're allowed to, if they're given the safe space and the permission and the breathing room and groups will too. So if you all, everyone out there listening can be a better coach, a better question asker, the person responsible for getting everyone uh, to that foundation of truth, oftentimes the right answer is completely self-evident. And that you yeah. will see in every case study of my book, what to do is rarely the problem here. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And, you know, I would just add you know, that the evidence on listening, sometimes what we learn about listening is how to look like you're listening, nod your head, make eye contact, mm -hmm. you know, say a few things back that seem to be supportive. But the evidence on being listened to suggests that we feel listened to when somebody is searching for deeper meaning. What is the real content and relevance of what we're talking about? So listening is not passive. It is a search. It's a collaborative search for the truth. Peter, I think that is a great and powerful message to end on. I want to encourage everybody to. Um, Go to Peter's website, find out what kind of honesty you represent. Check out this great book. Peter, congratulations. Thanks so much for joining us. It's absolutely my pleasure. Thanks for being honest.